Hi everyone, thanks for joining in. I'm excited to have Philippa East joining me. Hi Philippa. Hi, hi. Good uh, evening everyone or morning or wherever you are in the world or whatever time. <laughs> yeah. And um, a few of you might have seen, we've had Philippa here before as author for the day and for interviews before, so great to have you back again. Thank you, good to be here. So just a little bit about Philippa. Philippa grew up in Scotland and originally studied psychology and philosophy at the University of Oxford. After graduating, she moved to London to train as a clinical psychologist and worked in NHS mental health services for over 10 years. Philippa now lives in Lincolnshire countryside with her spouse and cat. Mm -hmm. And alongside her writing, she continues to work as a psychologist and therapist. And um, her latest book is her fourth book. I think hopefully I've got that right. Your fourth book, which is A Guilty Secret. Yeah, yeah. <laughs> I'm losing count. <laughs> and um, that was just released in February. So thanks for joining us. Just wondering if you want to start off by telling us a bit about it. So actually, oh, sorry. I... Yeah, I have actually confused you. So my fourth book is A Guilty Secret, but it's coming out this coming February. Oh, so this that's coming the one February. That is okay, sorry. I on the horizon. Number. So the latest. Sorry. Yeah, no, no, that was probably my mistake. So uh and the latest one that is out is called i'll never tell and that came out yeah at the beginning of this year so i let me know sorry which about you that tell you about but yeah no <laughs> if you want to start oh, off by <laughs> if you want to start off by telling us about i'll never tell sorry about that yeah no sure um i sometimes i get so excited about the next book that i've rushed on to that yeah. one <laughs> so, so I'll, yeah so i'll never tell is out now and it's another psychological thriller because that's the, the genre that i write in and love to read in um it's about the good light family who live in oxford in england and um they are um High-flying lawyer Julia, her husband Paul, who is a stay-at-home dad, um, mainly supporting their teenage daughter Chrissy, who is a rising star in the musical world as a violinist. And Chrissy is tipped to win the National Young Musician of the Year award. And she gets through to the semi-finals. She goes to the um, competition performance, televised, watched by an entire audience at the Barbican. Um, uh, Barbican Theatre in London. She gives an absolutely jaw-dropping performance and then later on that night she completely disappears. Mm -hmm. And the book is unravelling all the secrets in the not-so-perfect, after all, Good Light family. Mm -hmm. And can you tell us a bit about what the first idea was that you had for this? I think we froze for a for, little bit. For I'll Never Tell? Yes. Oh, sorry, Jackie, it's a little bit glitchy. <laughs> sorry, mm -hmm. I did, um, yeah, I missed, I missed that last question. Oh, can you hear me again? Yeah, we can hear you again. So just wondering if you could tell us what the first idea you had was for I'll Never Tell? Yeah, yeah, yeah. So, um, so I actually, it, it, it um, really came from two ideas that kind of came together. That's often how I create a book, is I'll have one idea that's been sit, sitting around in my head for a while. And then there'll be another idea that's bumping around in my head. So with this one, I had one idea, which was a car, a car in a foreign country, driving and kind of lost in this um completely unfamiliar landscape heading to a location where they'd been tipped off that their daughter was who had gone a wall and during the course of this car journey falling apart so that was sort of one idea that I had on one side and then on the other side I had this scene in my head of a 
teenage girl waking her father up very early in the morning to go for a training run together uh, to get fit and look good. Um, and it not being clear whether it was the dad who was really pushing for this or whether it was the daughter who mm. was driving this whole sort of training program. And then one day I realized that the girl in that scene doing the training runs with her father was the AWOL missing girl from mm. the other scene. And then I put those two together and I was like, ah. Uh, so it didn't yeah. actually start out as a missing person story. Oh, for me. Really? It was quite way down the line that I was yeah. like, I've read a missing person book, <laughs> but that's that's, the, that's how it started off. Yeah. Yeah. And what do you hope that um, readers will love about I'll Never Tell? Oh. Um, well, I think like a lot of my books, it's about flawed characters and their redemption arcs. I think, and I obviously like to throw in lots of twists and turns and secrets and revelations mm. along the way. But at, at the core, my books are always about characters trying to come to terms with a flaw in themselves and something they've got to face or address and, and ultimately confront. Um, so I think this, yeah, this book is about, you know, Chris, Chrissy, the teenage daughter, her disappearance is kind of the tragedy or the shock that forces this family to really confront themselves mm. um so yeah i think it's it's not it's not just about the twists and turns it's it's sort of about the the willingness to deal with stuff really and i hope i hope that is a mm. positive message for readers at the mm. end of the day mm. and can you tell us a little bit about how your publishing journey's been how did you get that first book published yeah, so I mean, I'm sure, as I'm sure the people who listen to your interviews, Jackie, know, it's it's always so different for different people, mm. and there's really no one size fits all. I mm. think my publishing journey was probably fairly to, fairly traditional. Mm. So I began, well, I you know, I used to write and enjoy creative writing as a kid, and I all I've always read books, so that wasn't completely unfamiliar to me. But then, obviously, a bit like you said at the start, I went on to train study psychology and train as a clinical psychologist. Mm. So this kind of idea of writing as an adult was not on my radar at all. That was not that was not something that in my world people did. But when I was about 30, I just started creative writing again, really just as a hobby, just as something fun to do in the evenings, at the weekends, whatever. I was like, I'll write a novel, yeah. <laughs> Um, and the novel that I started writing then is is too embarrassing to even <laughs> really talk about. But yeah. <laughs> um, I really got the bug for creative activity that was the best fit for me of all the things I had dabbled with through my life. Um, so so. When I realized that this novel I was writing was really just terrible and not marketable at all, I started writing short stories, which was a really good way to practice my writing and discover who I was as a writer and learn my craft. And, you know, I joined quite a few writers, you know, in, in London where I lived at the time. And then I started getting those short stories um, published in literary magazines or, or placed in, in short story competitions. And that, I think that was a really key moment where I thought, maybe I'm able to write at a publishable standard. Mm. Um, and I'd had an idea for a novel for a little while. And I, at that time, which would have been 2015, I left my full time NHS job and went into private practice. And I was able to work part time then. And it sort of felt like, you know, I had more time to write. I was starting to take it a lot more seriously. And I had this idea for a novel and it just seemed really obvious. It was like, I, I need to I need to write this novel right now is the time. Um, and that was the book that ultimately became my debut, um, Little White Lies. I forgot to say I've got my books here to show, mm, you, show them off. Yeah. Um, and in terms of actually getting a publishing deal, I met my age, 
assistant at a writing festival where we had sort of agent author speed dating which is something that often often festivals put on and she liked the sample that I'd sent her and she asked for the full manuscript which was fantastic I was so excited mm -hmm. I've been working on the book for probably a mm, year two years by mm -hmm. then um and when she read the full she decided it needed a page one rewrite <laughs> so that was a bit tricky uh, so I probably worked on it for another six to nine months with sort of uh, with her support um and then we submitted to publishers had an auction which was very exciting and I signed with ultimately signed with HQ HarperCollins so it was about a 10-year journey altogether okay, which well, is not yeah. unusual at all yeah, yeah yeah and is there anyone or anything that kept you going over those 10 years ah oh, that's such a good question I think um I just wanted it yeah I wanted to see because I, 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 like I say, I read a huge amount and the only way I can really fund my habit is using public libraries <laughs> because I would bankrupt myself if I bought books. And just to remind people, I, mean, I don't know if it's the same way you guys are, but in the UK, authors get paid for library loans. So it's... Yeah, it's, I think it's, it's the really same in Australia. Authors. Mm. Um, yeah, so I, I used to go into the library to, to, to get books out and I would just have this vision of seeing my book on the library shelf mm. and I just I just want I just wanted it and I, I suppose I believed in myself enough that yeah so even when you know I was having to kind of rip my book to shreds and start all over again with huge structural edits I just I just I just wasn't gonna stop it's kind of what I saw I just had this destination in mind and I was just going to do it. And I think because, I, again, I think maybe because I'd had the short stories published, I had, a, I had a sense that I was capable of writing something good enough to be published. Mm. And it was sort of, I just had to find the way and the path and do the work, basically. Mm. Yeah. Mm. And we've got a few people watching, so just wanted to say to those watching, if you do have any questions for Philippa, please type them and I can read them out. Um, Belinda said she's read I'll Never Tell and Little White Lies and she loved them both. Oh, thank you, Belinda. And Kelly wonders who your favourite author is to read. And I'm also wondering if maybe there's anything you might have read lately you'd like to recommend to us. Mm, yeah, so so I think, sorry, just one sec, I need to let my cat out because okay. she's being very bad. One sec. <laughs> Oh, I'm sorry about that. Um, so yeah, so the main the main genres that I read in, I, I read a huge amount of psychological thrillers. I absolutely love the genre. It's so broad, it's so diverse. Um, so so some of my well, I mean my kind of original inspiration in the in the genre, which isn't probably very original now, is Gillian Flynn and Gone Girl. I mean, I still see that mm -hmm. as the the masterwork of a contemporary psychological thriller. Obviously, she hasn't written anything. She hasn't written any novels since, so I'm a bit like, mm. Mm, that's annoying. <laughs> so, so other authors that I really like are um, Laura Lippman, who is a um, American author. I also like Fiona Cummins, who is a UK sort of crime thriller author. Um, oh, I always get stuck with this question because I, this is like, it's like I just read so much all the time. Mm. <laughs> so many people one of the authors that i've discovered recently actually is an author called um grady hendrix who writes these really interesting contemporary sort of they're they're, they're horror novels but they're sort of like slightly tongue-in-cheek and really interesting sort of uh -oh. social observation slash satire yeah. <laughs> novels kind of wrapped up in the horror genre so uh, i kind of binged on a few of his books recently so if you like your thrillers with a little bit of a dash of horror then mm. yeah he's someone that mm. i would i would recommend yep no thanks for those recommendations and kim um wonders if you read any australian authors 
yeah, yeah. In fact, I read a book like literally the other day. Uh, what's it called? Um, oh my gosh, this is going to really bug me now. <laughs> it's hang on. Please wait. I'm looking it up on my iPad. What was it called? It's set. In, it is like set in America. Uh, what was it? Oh, it's really going to bug me now. <laughs> I'll come back to that. I'll come back to that. <laughs> um, yeah, so um, uh, there's a book that I read recently called No Country for Girls, which I'm oh, sure yes. is set in America. Yeah. I, I know there was, a, mm. I heard there was a little bit of, a little bit of controversy over that, but I, I, mm. I read it and I really, really enjoyed it. Um, oh my God, what was the book that I read? Oh, wait, hang on. Let me see. I think I maybe got it clothes, as a um, some clothes about it, and someone might know what it was called. <laughs> yeah, you can always post it in the in the Facebook group. Yeah. If I um, uh, I think it was a I think it was an advanced copy of something that I that I got actually. Um, oh, oh, it was um. Hang on, I think it's called the Under History by. Hang on. I put a post about it on Twitter, so let me look that up. Um, okay, hang on. Because <sighs> I'm like, I, I like, I, w I want to, rec I do want to recommend it because I thought it was really good. Um, <clears throat> where are we? <laughs> Here we go. Okay, the Under History by. Who is it by? Oh, doesn't even say Karoon someone. So it's, um, yeah, it's basically about a woman who um, does, gives ghost tours of her own house oh, after okay. her entire I family died in this really weird thing. Mm. <laughs> so, yeah. I haven't heard of that book at all. So. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Mm. I think so, it's coming out soon. Sounds interesting. Um, and I was just wondering, what when you're writing, is there a favourite place you like to write? And... Do you have like a favourite snack or drink while you're writing? Well, I drink a lot of tea yeah. <laughs> because I am British. <laughs> um, so I usually have some kind of yeah hot drink on the go to, mm. to keep you going. Um, and uh, yeah, um, so I, I, I'm really lucky actually in the house that I live in now. Um, I have like a little little office space up a little separate flight of stairs right at the back of the house so that's my writing room and I've kind of got it all set up with all my you know bits of paper and notebooks and post-its and all sorts of things mm -hmm. um so so that's my official writing room but sometimes sometimes I don't like to be tied down to that so I might write in bed because then I can trick my brain that I'm not really <laughs> not really working <laughs> Sometimes if it's nice weather, I'll take the blanket out and sit on the lawn in our in our garden. And I've also got a hammock, which I sometimes oh, nice. sit in, which is quite yeah. luxurious. Mm. <laughs> um, so so a bit I, I kind of yeah, although I have my official writing room, I'm always in strange spots around the house, like trying to kid myself I'm not actually having to do work. <laughs> mm. And can you tell us a bit about what you're working on at the moment? Yeah, absolutely. So it's always a little bit strange because, you know, publishing schedules always run kind of a year to 18 months behind mm. where the author is at. So, so, um, I, so I've just finished the final, final, final edits on, um, a guilty secret, which is, okay. as, as we were saying, mm. is, is coming out. Um, actually it was, um, originally coming out in February, but they brought the publication date forward, which oh, is forward. very exciting. That's a, so yeah. it's going to be out. <laughs> That's a bit different, bringing the, it forward. <laughs> yeah, yeah. So so um, in the UK, at least, it's going to be out mid-January. And I think probably, I think similar timing elsewhere as, as well. So that book is um, uh, primarily set in a exclusive boarding school in Scotland mm. and involves a group of teenagers getting up to some dodgy things in the woods behind the school and Aww. then getting themselves in some rather big trouble and having to hold a guilty secret for 
into their adult lives. Mm. But someone's going to break their pact and expose mm. everything. Oh, no, so, that's so, so, sounds <laughs> great. Just finished. <laughs> so I've just finished the edits on that. And I'm currently in the midst of writing my fifth book, which is going to be set in Fiji, actually. Well, fingers crossed if, if my editor oh, really? likes it. I just got back from Fiji a couple of weeks oh. ago. Have you been Oh, I there? might have to... Sorry? Have you been? No, okay. no. I mean, obviously, it's quite a long way from here. Yeah. Um, so I, I might have to pick your brains, Jackie. Yeah, and, I've been uh, to know, Fiji you down a for a couple of times. <laughs> oh, lovely, lovely. So I'm doing a lot of, I'm doing a lot of internet research and um, <laughs> sort of things to try and mm. get get a little bit of a sense. But mm. yeah, that's... that's no, that a, sounds um, exciting. Different. Like, mm. Mm. And what have you found for yourself to be the most difficult part of your writing process? Um, probably for me, uh, it's the point where I've written a very, very messy first draft. Mm -hmm. And for me, it's really rare to get the basic plot working first time there's I think I, I think this is probably a thing about psychological thrillers generally that um although they they are a very uh commercial genre and have a lot of kind of um recognizable conventions to it there isn't really a, a formula in the same way that for example a crime book has quite a clear structure you know you have a, you have the crime or the discovery of a crime at the beginning you have some sort of detective character they go around searching for clues and then they reveal who the perpetrator was at the end but with a psychological thriller from your premise such as you know for example safe and sound which is mm. my my second one uh, the premise is about this you know young charismatic sociable woman whose death goes unnoticed for 10 months after she dies in her bedsit now that story could kind of go anywhere. So often I write a first draft with one version of how events might play out and how this story and how this inciting event might um, affect the characters and affect the dynamics. But it's really common for me to then, you know, realize that that isn't the best version of the story and, and have to go right back and, mm. and replot it almost from scratch and mm. that's the bit that i find really painful because mm. it's like dismantling the entire work of art mm. <laughs> and kind of then you've just got it like a mess on the floor like you've just tipped a lego box out mm. you've got to then reconfigure mm. it so yeah i like writing the first draft because i'm just like mm. <laughs> and i'm quite happy doing kind of the the late on edits because i just do them in front of the telly and they're quite they're mm. just like fixing typos mm. <laughs> but that's the bit that i it's always quite soul destroying yeah yeah, <laughs> yeah. and melinda's <laughs> got a quest a good question she says do you know the twists or endings when you start your book well that kind of it goes back to what i've just said absolutely that i might have and well i i probably have some idea of some kind of ending mm. even when i'm sort of loosely planning the book in advance and and i will have um kind of mapped out certain twists or revelations to come from you know point a the start to point z or whatever at the end but very very often that will change mm. uh and you know for example in i'll never tell that went the the version that you know is is the story now was kind of version three and in version one the the kind of villain was a completely different character version two the story again was very very different in terms of how things played out and what the revelations were mm. and it was like i kind of had to keep digging and digging to get to what the real story was so so yes and no is i suppose the answer to that mm. that i'll have an idea but it often it's often not that 
story that ends up being the the one that is the final version mm. um, mm. which is a bit i find a bit scary to be honest because it's like how do you know when you've when you've told the correct story like yeah. what's the true <laughs> story <laughs> like it could be anything and how yeah. like how do you how do i make the decision about <laughs> this is how this is what the story is i don't know it feels I don't know. Did you it ever, when you were a, when I was a child, I loved reading the choose your own adventure books. Yes. So you could have a different ending every. Do you know what? I feel like we need a a, a revival of those books. Yeah. Imagine doing it's like imagine someone writing a psychological thriller mm. that was a choose your own I adventure. Know. Like, actually, don't share mm. that idea. <laughs> I'm gonna write it. Don't let anyone. We need else. an adult <laughs> version of yeah. Yeah. Mm. yeah because what an interesting kind of narrative device mm. you know about who you trust who's the unreliable narrator mm. what clues are you are you following mm. Mm. <laughs> and um kim wonders if there's anything you've changed from writing your first book uh, do you mean in sort of times of process and yeah how i think I go that's about what it? she yeah. means yeah yeah so so absolutely yes so so when i when i wrote little white lies mm. i really I, I really didn't know how to go about writing a novel i'd kind of written this other one like 10 years ago but mm. I, that was just for fun again i didn't know what i was doing and although i'd written short stories constructing a short story and constructing a ninety thousand word novel is obviously a completely different beast it's like running a sprint versus training for a marathon mm. so I didn't really do any, any planning for Little White Lies. And again, because the premise of Little White Lies is this missing child is found alive and returns home after seven years. Mm. And again, like that story could go anywhere. Like what's, what happens after that? I don't know. Um, so I didn't do any planning because I didn't know what the story was going to be. And I wrote just like, a whole patchwork of individual scenes and then tried to make a story out of it. Now that meant that it took something horrible, like 25 drafts to mm. actually create <laughs> the final version. So then, uh, then when I came to writing my next book, I was like, I'm not doing that again. Mm. <laughs> so, so with, with um, my second and my first attempt at my third book, I wrote um really detailed typed outlines for my agent and editor like they were sort of like three thousand words long and it was it was a full synopsis and it was like this is what the book is going to be bum 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 and kind of went back and forth with my agent and my editor on on finessing those outlines and it was like okay if we get the outline right at this stage then all i need to do is follow the outline outline and write the book right great so i did that for safe and sound and then wrote the book according to the outline mm. and it didn't it just didn't it didn't mm. work as a book yeah. and and I, I did this a similar thing for my third book and it was even worse like the book that the book that i wrote uh initially just was so not working that we threw it in the bin oh, really? <laughs> so there's a, there's a whole lot of ghost book between safe and sound and I'll never tell that never mm. never made it basically <laughs> so so what I do now which feels like it works for me is I do very loose creative planning in a notebook so I will never do a typed outline again over my dead body mm. <laughs> um and I just allow myself to really explore the story in a notebook with lots of colored pens and you know scribbly arrows and you know, brainstorms of, you know, could be this plot point, this plot point, this plot point, little character sketches, all of this kind of stuff. Until I feel like I've got a handle on, on the book, but it's, it's much more, it, I think that process is much more intuitive and organic. And it translates in, in my experience, it's, it translates much better into a working book. Mm -hmm. Um, uh, so it may, my process I'm sure will still change. I'm still trying to find the one that means I can work smart rather than hard, but yeah. at the moment 
yeah, we'll see. We'll mm. see. But yeah, yes, it definitely has changed. I'm still learning on the job. <laughs> <laughs> and uh, the, uh, the more you write, do you find that it gets easier for you or harder? I like to say easier so far mm. in that um, I think partly going back to the whole thing about process, I feel a bit more confident in my process. I feel a, I feel like I understand the principles and craft of writing a novel better. So I feel mm. like I know what I'm doing and I'm not making so many kind of rookie errors in terms of, uh, you know, I, I, for example, I know how to make pacing work or I know where I need to put key kind of twists or reveals and how mm. the beats of the story work. I know, I know more about how to develop a character arc. So, um, so I feel like I have more, um, I feel like I'm better qualified to create a novel now. Mm. Um, so I think maybe, maybe I'm in a kind of like happy sweet spot at the minute in that I feel like I'm better at writing novels, but I'm not yet struggling to come up with new ideas because yeah. I think that's something that could get difficult down the line yeah. is not ending up just writing kind of regurgitations. Mm. Um, but readers, ultimately readers are going to be the judge. Like they're going to be the ones that decide if my books are still good and or getting better or whether I'm going off the boil. Mm. So you let me know guys, mm. <laughs> give me a kick up the arse. <laughs> <laughs> and talking about readers, do you get a lot of feedback from readers? And just wondering if there might be something you could share with us that may be surprised or um, really invigorated you. Yeah, yeah. I mean, I because I because I am on social media. You know, I'm mm. on Facebook, Twitter, and obviously mm. that okay. There's lots of problems with social media, but it does mean that there's a really a really direct way to be in touch for me to be in touch with my readers mm. and I and I would hope for readers to be in touch with me so I'm always really thrilled if a reader you know um puts a little reply on on Twitter or or, or says hello or whatever I'm like hi <laughs> so yeah that's that's lovely for me and I I really appreciate it when yeah when readers you know tag me and say that they've enjoyed my book or that mm. they're going to, you know, that they're looking forward to reading it or something or, or whatever. I think, so one of the things I did, um, when I was, um, about to embark on writing book five is I took a leaf out because I, I heard an interview with, um, the author Erin Kelly, and she had said when she was sort of trying to think about how to take her writing and her career forwards, she was like, she said she sat down and she read all her reviews <laughs> to get a really, like almost do like a kind of statistical analysis of mm -hmm. like, what do readers like? What are they picking up on? What, how do they see me as an author? So I sat down and I did that for, uh, I think for my first, yeah, for my first two or, or three books. Um, and it was really interesting because one of the things that I found was um like half the readers were like oh I love to the slow burn and how much she gets into the characters and it's you know it's a really kind of layered story mm. and then the other half were like oh these books are so slow mm. there's so much waffle about what the mm. characters are thinking and I was like oh, okay so you can't please all readers mm. and at the end of the day you know I I will focus on making my books as pacey as they can, but at the end of the day, I'm going to write in my style and there's probably not a lot I can do about that. Um, so that was quite interesting that, yeah, it's like the same book, of course, will, will split opinion because readers mm. are looking for different things. Some, yeah. some readers just really want a really smack bang pacey page turner. Mm. Um, and the other, the other thing that's, that's really nice is, um, so I have a scene at the end of Little White Lies for those of those of you who have who have read it or, or who go on to read it, we're not giving any spoilers away, but it's the scene with cousins Jess and, and Abigail, Abigail being the, the girl who's returned, on the railway bridge at the at the very end. Mm. And um there were some readers who were like, 
I, I don't get that scene. I don't really know what what it is or what it's about. But I've also had readers who, there was one reader in particular who messaged me to say that she was a survivor of, of childhood trauma and things like that. And she said, that scene resonated with me so much. I have never read something that encapsulates my feelings of being misunderstood in in my trauma as well as that is that scene and i was like mm. wow because that's exactly what mm. i was trying to capture and mm. maybe for some people th for whatever reason they wouldn't relate to that but for for certain readers they really did and i suppose those were the readers that that, that i was speaking to yeah. so that was that that, that, that message amazing, made such yeah. a lot to me and i was like oh mm. wow this, yeah mm. Yeah. Well, thanks so much for chatting with me. It's been great talking to you again. Oh, a pleasure. Looking forward pleasure, to reading Jackie. more of your books and finding out about more of um, the things you've been doing. So thanks so much. Thank you, guys. And, and lovely to chat with mm. you all. <laughs> and thanks to those who joined in and asked some questions.